Thanks very much. Um, Minister, I suppose I'd like to start by saying that, um, that there are elements of this bill that I welcome, um, that I believe are long overdue. Um, and I think in the spirit of cooperation, it's important to, to mention that and, um, and to, um, to identify the fact that, uh, in particular, um, while the bill uh, affords greater rights to fathers, it also, um, by extension, places greater responsibility on fathers. And I think that that is something to be welcome, though I would like to see the bill go further, and I, I'll mention that in a moment. Uh, and I think uh, in, enshrining and um, uh, supporting the rights and the uh, connections uh, between children and their grandparents is a very positive step forward as well and it's something um, that I very strongly and wholeheartedly support um, particularly at a time when in our society you know families are splintered uh, often you have you know children uh, having or having children and growing their families in urban areas, maybe away from where they grew up and so on, uh, that link can become um, severed or, or at least weakened. Um, and uh, I think it's important um, to, to acknowledge that it is enhanced in this bill. From my perspective, the rights of children um, have to supersede all else um, uh, when it comes to um, issues surrounding uh, human reproduction, issues surrounding adoption, uh, issues surrounding uh, ch child safety and child protection. Um, it's all about the children and frankly I don't believe that the interests, the desires or the wishes of adults uh, particularly come into play. That's my starting point. Um, that's why I was happy to support the children's referendum in 2012. Um, it was about, um, I mean, the stated objective was about placing children's needs and children's rights at the heart of our constitution and by extension at the heart of our justice system. Um, and that was welcome. Uh, that was something that I was happy to support. And that was something that I think we still have yet to see the, the, the fruit of that because um, a lot of, I suppose, a lot of the, um, the, the, the legislation that needs to flow from it hasn't yet um, been implemented or a lot of the, I suppose, the resources that need, need to be put in place haven't yet um, been put there. But we, we certainly live in hope and I, I hope that, um, that the passing of the children's referendum in 2012 will lead to, to greater and, and much enhanced rights and supports and protections for children. Um, I have a concern that elements of this bill do the opposite. Um, and I suppose specifically, um, I have a concern that this bill um, breaks or purports to break the link between natural biological parents and um, their children in certain circumstances, and particularly by via the so-called donor-assisted human reproduction provisions. I have concerns about them, and I know from, from speaking to, um, to members of the public that there are a, a very significant cohort of Irish people who feel the same way, uh, and I feel that a, a lot of those concerns are not being represented in this debate. It's a very one-dimensional debate, um, as we've come to, to, to expect, unfortunately, in this chamber in the last number of years. Um, I, I, want to, I want to say clearly, assisted human reproduction, um, particularly IVF, has, um, has massive benefits uh, for society, uh, massive benefits for parents who have difficulty conceiving, and obviously also for, for the children um, who are born as a result of assisted human reproduction, um, and uh, in particular IVF. Um, there are massive positives from it, and, um, and we all know um, couples who have, um, have, have benefited um, from um, that assistance, and children who have been born into happy and healthy environments and that's absolutely to be welcomed. But I fear that what is proposed in this bill um, has the potential, well, will in fact sever the link between children and their natural biological parents. Um, children potentially will, well, children will in fact only have the right to find out about their natural, natural mother or father um, at the age of 18. Um, now, my view when it comes to children's rights is that child, children's rights actually kick in. Um, from the moment they're born, or even before they're born, um, not at the age of 18, when they reach the age of maturity, um, their whole childhood has passed at that stage without knowing uh, or having any right to know who their biological parent is. And uh, this is a massive departure. It's being played down by the government as if it's inconsequential. It's not. It's a huge departure. It goes way beyond what most European countries are doing. Um, in relation to assisted human rep uh, reproduction and I have concerns about it and I would like to hear the Minister um, address those concerns uh, in, her, in her remarks. Um, 
I'd like to know how the Minister intends to safeguard, um, particularly against the risk of commodification of children um, um, through the abuse or the potential abuse of assisted human, human reproduction um, and some of the clauses in this legislation. Um, I, I don't have time to go into it in any great detail, but I will certainly be participating at committee stage if I have the opportunity. Um, when it comes to um, um, the proposed changes to adoption laws, um, my, my starting position is that I very much support flexibility. There is no perfect model, um, and we all know, and we hear endlessly from, from the Minister and from others on the government benches about the need to reflect uh, reality and the need to reflect society. That's true within reason. Uh, we absolutely need to protect the interests of children. That's true without any uh, reservation. Um, I spoke on the Civil Partnership Bill in this chamber in 2010 where the reality of children being raised, uh, for example, by same-sex couples was completely ignored. And that was wrong. And at the time, um, I, I said that this needed to be addressed uh, in, order, in order to protect the rights of children in those circumstances. Um, and what I would love to see is not a blunt instrument, but rather, I suppose, the, the, the recognition that there are individual circumstances and that, you know, while in most circumstances, and I think it's, it's reasonable to state this, I, I, I don't think the Minister agrees with me, unfortunately, but but in most instances, it is desirable that a child be raised by their mother and their father. We're, we're reasonable and we're, we're practical. Obviously, there are a huge number of examples where that's not the case. But, but, but when it comes to adoption and you know, giving, I suppose, recognising the rights of children, they do have a right to a mother and fa father in most in instances. But there are circumstances, and I certainly am familiar with um, examples of, for example, where, um, where a woman uh, has, uh, has a child, um, the father has disappeared, has no interest and has no involvement involvement in raising that child and therefore isn't involved in, in access or guardianship or anything like that and where that woman is in a relationship with another, another woman or indeed another man and that person has no right in respect of that child and that child has no right in, in respect of that parent. Uh, in those circumstances there has to be flexibility and I absolutely believe that the legislation sh should reflect that but I just want to to read into the record a response to a parliamentary question um, of just uh, a few weeks ago where the Minister for Children said um, it can be taken that the, the number of sole applicants adopting non-related children is extremely low um, and would occur only in exceptional circumstances, Ex for example, where a foster family intended to adopt a foster child and one of the couple, couple died and the other proceeded with the adoption. Um, the reason for the exceptional nature of these adop adoptions are that birth mothers giving their children for adoption typ typically choose a couple and also that sole applicants are not automatically eligible to adopt but must satisfy the authority um, that in the particular circumstances the adoption is desirable. I think that's a reasonable standard. I think that has served us pretty well in this state. Um, so I mean, essentially what, what the Minister for Children is telling us is that you know, the, the authority um, looks at all of the circumstances, looks at the best interests of the child, tries to, tries to ensure that, um, that the child will have, um, will have um, a mother and a father figure in their lives, but, but not in every circumstances and, and that there is a reality and in exceptional circumstances that reality can be reflected. I think that's reasonable and I think that that um, should continue to be the case uh, and I fear that, um, that the Minister is moving uh, far beyond that uh, and I think that would be unfortunate. Um, I just want to touch very briefly on fathers' rights. And I have welcomed the fact that fathers' rights, um, um, or the right of children, to have, more importantly, to have a relationship with their father, um, is, is reflected in this bill. And I think that, that that's right. But one thing that I am concerned about is that um, well, we're all aware that fathers have been discriminated against in family law and will probably continue to be um, for, for decades to come. Um, but one thing this bill does is it per perpetuates the injustice um, from the point of view of children. Um, uh, I think Deputy Shatter referred to, to this in, in some way yesterday. Um, but the, the fact that the rights of natural fathers can now, in a sense, be undermined by a third party um, who, because of a relationship with the mother, um, can become a third legal guardian, I have concerns about that. I think that um, it potentially will, will um, discriminate against the relationship between a child and their natural father. Um, fathers who already struggle in many instances to have uh, proper access and a proper relationship with their, with their own natural child. Um, and I think that that is wrong and I have concerns about it and I'd like to, to hear the Minister address it. Um, and my final point that I want to make is uh, very briefly that I'm deeply concerned at the fact that surrogacy is excluded from this. Um, 
I think it should be included, as was originally intended. Um, and I, I just want to draw attention to a quote from the Taoiseach uh, here on the record on the 30th of September 2014, where he said, I'm concerned that if it is dealt with, that is surrogacy, in the context of the Children and Family Relationships Bill, the process would be delayed and it would not be possible to ask a clear question in the context of the marriage equality referendum. So what I deduce from that is that the Taoiseach is saying, well, we want the referendum to pass, so therefore we'll, we'll muddy the waters and we'll leave the surrogacy issue to a later date. I think that's very dishonest and as somebody who is supportive of, of the marriage equality referendum and I've said I intend to vote for it because I, do, I don't believe that any couple should be discriminated against and I think that people have a right um, to be treated equally and fairly before the law um, but, I, but I do think that hiding the surrogacy issue um, for a later date um, so as to ensure the passage of the referendum is entirely dishonest um, and I, I think the fact that the Taoiseach has essentially put that on the record already um, well, leaves us with, without any doubt. Um, so I think that's unfortunate. Thank you.